Now, uh, from the uh, Milton Foundation, allow me to welcome our uh, next guest, the Senior Ophthalmic Consultant at Saifi Hospital and Consultant uh, Ophthalmologist at Muscati Eye Clinic, all the way from welcome. Mumbai, Dr. Kuresh B. Muscati, uh, who will be talking about the tips and tricks in prison prescription. Dr. Muscati, are you here with us? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, uh, yes, uh, uh, very good evening, sir, and uh, welcome to the Advancing Optometry uh, Education Conference, and thank you so much for being with us. Okay, so I'm going to speak a little bit about uh, a subject which is uh, not very, very, very uh, well tackled by ophthalmologists at all, and uh, uh, left to their optometrists to do, and many times uh, the optometrist has not even referred the patient, so it's, it's difficult for them to handle. So this is about um, uh, four years or um, um, uh, latent squints and uh, when and where we should be using prisms, how should we be using them, uh, what is the role in the 21st century of Maddox rods and Maddox wing. So we'll talk a little bit about different heterophorias in this um, uh, session. This is me with Ken Wright way back uh, about 20 years ago uh, in uh, California where I picked up the nuances from him. Uh, so is heterophoria or latent squint important? Yes, there is a strain due to constant effort to maintain fusion, along with visual disturbance due to improper binocular fiction, fixation. You see the patient, an adult patient, for example, is straining to maintain fusion all the time. That's not his natural. It is not something that he is, would like to do, but he is forced to strain to maintain the binocular fixation. And this eye strain was called asthenopia, recognized way back in 1862 by Von Graffe and by Donders a couple of years later. So these patients often have headaches, sometimes photophobia and blurred vision for distance or near, occasionally even a diplopia. All these symptoms are relieved by closing one eye. Now in Mumbai, where I practice, I'm very close to the diamond industry. And very often I get jewelers coming in, goldsmiths coming in, who keep having to do fine work. And, and they find that there's a lot of eye strain. They go to two, three doctors, they're given minus quarter, plus quarter glasses, or even a, a, a reading number glasses, though they're 25 years of age, just because they're not diagnosed. So a jeweler with esophoria or a tennis player, for example, with exophoria will lose their jobs. The tennis player cannot function. If he's all, all the time, his eyes are straining to see binoculars. So what are the symptoms? Those with vertical squints, verti vertical phorias or torsional phorias are the most symptomatic. They can't, you, uh, the uh, patients cannot tolerate even a small degree of this. But those with horizontal phorias, because they are young, they may be able to manage. But by the end of the day, they feel very bad. Or if a patient is unwell or if there is overactivity, such as a child becoming symptomatic during exams, this is quite typical. When there is a hormonal imbalance, symptoms may worsen during pregnancy or during breastfeeding. And typically the symptoms can disappear when a patient is fit or during school holidays for the child. So many times the children are referred to psychiatrists and psychologists saying that this child is, I think, avoiding school or not liking school because he keeps complaining of headaches when he goes to school and comes home. And on holidays, he doesn't have headaches. So there must be something wrong. So he goes to different psychiatrists and psychologists, unfortunately. But again, important thing to remember that symptoms may disappear when the squint becomes finally manifest, then diagnosis becomes easy. Or if you close one eye, because it's a binocular issue. So two simple things, tools that I use, which are from ancient times, is one is the Maddox rod to diagnose latent squint for distance. And the other is the Maddox wing. So Maddox rod, Normally, a patient of heterophoria or latent squint will show no deviation due to desire for binocular vision. But by artificial means, which is uh, the Maddox rod, 
if the image formed in one eye is altered in appearance making fusion with the unaltered image of the other eye impossible the desire for fusion is suspended because they are seeing two dissimilar images and so dissociation occurs so now he is seeing one thing with one eye and another thing with the other eye so we are making his latent squint manifest so since there is no suppression artificially induced diplopia we are causing a diplopia he doesn't of course realize that this is diplopia so what is maddox rod it is basically a glass rod or rods mounted on a disc usually red in color it refracts rays of light in only one direction which is at right angles to the axis so if you can see the slide here if, if you can see this this is the light, the red rods are pointing vertically can you see my arrow so the rods are vertical and the light that he sees is horizontal so you will see like a red light like you can see here which is at right angles to where the rods are placed so what does this this maddox rod do it converts a point of light that is looking at into a red line which is at 90 degrees to the placement of the rod i hope you are with me now so what is the procedure for horizontal phorias so if you are suspecting eso or exophoria you place the maddox rod with the grooves sorry you place the maddox rod with the grooves horizontal before the patient's right eye as you can see in the lower part of your screen that with the patient's right eye here the rods are kept horizontal so that he will see a vertical red light vertical red line so he sees a vertical red line with the left eye patient can fix a spot of light on a snellens chart at 6 meters if you like you can put a plain green glass like you have done in the picture in front of the left eye with this eye if you put a green glass you will see a green dot if you don't put any glass you will see a yellow dot so here i have shown you the interpretation so if if there if there is orthophoria the red line will bisect the green dot or the yellow dot like this this is orthophoric while if it is esophoria the line will be to the right of the dot and if it's exophoria the line will be to the left of the dot so all you have to do is see where where the line is in relation to the dot and bang you've got to know you know now whether it's eso or exo for distance so it's a very very simple test to do what about vertical phoria so simple you simply turn the maddox rod at 90 degrees so now you have the maddox rod at 90 degrees so the lines of vertical and the light is horizontal so he sees a horizontal red light red line and again the same thing if you put a green glass in front of the left eye then you will see a green dot or a yellow dot if you don't put a glass I've, just for making it easy to see i made it green so if it's orthophoria the red line will bisect or the uh, will bisect the green dot if it's a right hyperphoria where then the uh, green the red line will be below the dot and if it's a right hypophoria the red line will be above the dot as you can see here so again just by turning it 90 degrees you get a very good idea of whether there is a vertical squint and if so whether there is right hyperphoria or right hypophoria obviously you know there is right hyperphoria it will be left hypophoria and vice versa can you measure the degree of the squint yes by this simple test you simply put the maddox rods first and then in the other eye you put or in the same eye you put correcting prisms or helping prisms of increasing strength in front of the right eye so if it's an exo you already diagnosed exo you put a prism with base in for exo and base out for eso till the red line bisects the spotlight for horizontal phorias and exactly the same way you turn it for vertical phorias if you want to correct use a helping prism you will use a base down prism for right hyperphorias we know uh, uh, that that uh, the light is in any prism the light is deflected or ref refracted towards the base of the prism so if there's a right hyperphoria you want the base down so that the light is brought below is brought lower and so base up for right hypophorias till the red line bisects the spotlight for vertical phorias you can even repeat this from i told you everything with the red the maddox rod in the right eye you can repeat the test in the other eye with the maddox rod in the other eye also usually the result will be the same unless there is a mild paresis so again you can even diagnose whether there is a mild paresis if there is an unequal uh, uh, prism correction required when you change the eye in which you put the maddox rod what about cyclophorias so keep two maddox rods as you can see in the picture red in front of one eye and green or red in front of the other eye so now if you got if you got two lines one red line and one green line or if you don't have the green you can put two reds doesn't matter 
Now, if there is no Fourier, the two streaks of light should be parallel like this. If one of the two lines are pointing towards each other or away from each other, you know that there is some element of cyclophoria. So you can diagnose horizontal screens, vertical screens, as well as cyclophorias uh, using the Maddox rod for distance. What about Maddox wing test? This is to use to get exactly the same results for near. So used to test heterophoria for near. The patient looks through, you can see the picture of the Maddox wing. The wing divides the visual field into two halves because there is a central line, central uh, shield as it were. So again, you're causing dissociation of the image. One eye will see the horizontal row of figures in white and a vertical row of figures in red. And the other eye will see a white arrow, which is pointing vertically upwards and a red arrow pointing horizontally. So if there's no phoria, the arrows will all point to zero. If the arrow, as you can see the lady over there, if the arrow is pointing to even numbers, the patient has an exo, they've made it foolproof, idiot proof as it were. So on, on, on one side of the horizontal line, the numbering goes from zero, one, two, four, six, eight on the exo side. So if, if the patient tells me that the arrow is pointing to eight, I know that there is exophoria. If it is pointing to odd numbers on the right side of the screen, of that black screen, the numbers are 0, 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, 11, and so on. So the patient tells me that the arrow is pointing to 11. Even closing my eyes, I know that he has an esophoria. It's important that patients should hold the wing directing as like a reading position, directing it downwards in small kids. And of course, put the reading ad if it's an adult uh, press by a patient. In small kids, confirm that the two eyes are looking through the two slits and can't be done in very small children because the interpupillary distance is not adjustable in these Maddox wings. So what are the prescription tricks? How do we give them prisms now? So how do you relieve the heterophoria? We use what is called relieving or helping prisms. That is prisms which neutralize the deviation. So always easy to remember, the apex of the prism is always in the direction of the deviation. So for example, if, and the base is in the direction opposite the deviation. So again, we'll see it by examples. Apex in the direction of deviation, base in the direction opposite the deviation. Now, whenever we are prescribing prisms, we always talk about base in or base out. So let's remember just the base part. The base is in the direction opposite the deviation. So if it's an exo where the eye is going out, the base will be in. Direction opposite. If it's an ESO with the eyes coming in, the base will be out. So that's how you prescribe your prism. So horizontal phorias are corrected with base in prisms for exo in Maddox wing. A small horizontal exo of six to eight diopters in adults should be ignored as it's a natural reduction of convergence due to aging. So they should be higher than that. But if it's not presbyopic person, if it's a 25 year old jeweler, as I said, even a six to eight exo will cause him a lot of uh, discomfort needs correction. How do you prescribe the prism? Suppose I put in helping prisms. Patient has got eight. He, he sees eight number on the Maddox wing. And I corrected him. I, he, he may take it, the number doesn't denote the number amount of prism. So he might require 10 prism diopter to bring the arrow to zero one. Now you have to split the required correction equally between the two eyes. And I correct not more than one third or even one fourth of the total prism. See, you don't want his eyes to stop converging. You want the prism to, uh, you want the patient to be helped, not the patient to be totally satiated. It said, give a man a fish and uh, 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 satiate him, but give, teach him how to fish and he'll be happy. So here you correct. So if, for example, if the Maddox wing fully corrected with 10 diopters basin, I would prescribe not more than 2.5 to 3 diopters total. So one third to one fourth of the requirement. And I split it between the two eyes. So I prescribe 1.25 to 1.5 prism base in each eye. Why do I do this? I give him just that much so that his asthenopia or his eye strain or his headaches are cured, but not so much that his eyes don't do the work. Because later on, I want his eyes to struggle more, to exercise more. And then after six months, one year, I might reduce the amount of prism required. So every effort should be made in horizontal foreheads to reduce the amount of prism over time. Vertical foreheads, the tip is don't under prescribe. The full correction should be prescribed because the eyes can never uh, compensate. So, so for example, if there is a right hyperphoria requiring 10 diopters for correction, 
I will give five diopters base down in right eye and five diopters base up in left eye. We know that for vertical phorias, it unlike unlike in the horizontal where you give an exophoria base in in both the eyes or an esophoria base out in both the eyes. If it's a vertical squint, you will give five diopters base down in the right eye for right hyperphoria because, as I said, opposite direction. The base is in the opposite direction, and five diopters base up in the left eye. Suppose both horizontal and vertical phorias are present. What will you do? Just give only the vertical component. First of all, it's a headache to make the prisms. Not everyone makes it, and it's almost impossible to do both. So just do the vertical. Most of the problem is asthenopia, is eye strain, is because of the vertical component. Usually, this gives complete relief. If only horizontal phoria is corrected and vertical is neglected, you are doomed to failure. So give the vertical pay importance to that. What about how much of prism can you give? So giving less than one diopter prism is rarely necessary, except as a placebo effect or in vertical phorias. In vertical, even one diopter you need to give. So I, I don't give anything less than one diopter prism, and you cannot give too high a prism in spectacles as they are extremely heavy, and the prism will cause a lot of distortion. So how do we manage that? If a patient requires say 15 diopters, as you can see in the slide here, I I, I may have to re resort to special prisms called wafer or membrane prisms. Or fres Fresnel prisms, or Fresnel prisms, uh, as you would like to call them. So to summarize, I have shown you that asthenopia or eye strain uh, due to phorias needs to be treated, needs to be given attention. So whenever you find that there is no significant refractive error, please try the Maddox rod and Maddox wing test. You don't need the synaptophore. Um, once you do that, you'll be able to diagnose uh, the uh, prism requirement or phorias for distance or for near. Once you've done that, you know how to prescribe one third to one fourth of the requirement to be split equally in the two eyes for horizontal four years. The full prism correction to be given for vertical, but with base up in one eye and base down in the other eye, and call the patients after every three to six months and reassess and see if you can reduce the amount of prism. Teach them convergence exercises for the exophorias and so on. So uh, uh, prisms is something which should be part of every optometrist armamentarium. And you will convert unhappy patients who have gone doctor shopping to friends of yours for life. Thank you so much for your attention. I'll be happy to answer questions. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Muscati. That was indeed a wonderful presentation.